Hi guys, in this video we are going to talk about one of the creepier worms, in my opinion, um, called the African eye worm or Loa Loa. And here is actually a rather disturbing images, just to get an idea of how big and gross this worm is. This whole kind of raised clear line in this person's eyeball, yeah. That's one worm. When I was researching this video, I came across some really creepy surgical removals of Loa Loa worms on YouTube, um, which I think you could go down a whole YouTube rabbit hole on if you actually wanted to. Um, okay, so let's talk about some specific things regarding the Loa Loa worm. First off, it's a worm. It's a nematode. It's actually a filarial nematode. So that means at some point we're going to be talking about microfilari. Um, the, it is the main cause of a condition known as loiasis or loasis, depending on who you're talking about. And we don't see much of it in the United States, um, but it is endemic to West and Central Africa, hence why it is often called the African eye worm. Okay, so anytime we talk about parasites, we know we need to know a couple of things. First off, the infective form. Second off, the diagnostic form. And in this case, we have an added thing we have to know. We have to know the vector, right? Because anytime we talk about vector-borne illnesses, we need to know what the vector is. That's kind of a key thing for how we could control it and how our patients could avoid it. So key points of this, the infective form is the larvae. This is very similar to another parasite I talk about in this case, Onco or Ancho, depending on, again, your, felt, your preferred pronunciation. Um, the diagnostic and the disease-causing form is actually either the microfilare or the adult worms. Again, just kind of depending on the tissue sample. In this case, the vector is the chrysops fly. The chrysops fly is also sometimes known as the mag magno fly. Um, um, and the way this works is not that dissimilar from the life cycle I talked about for Ancho. So basically you have a fly, the Chrysops fly, that takes a blood meal. This fly is infected with Loa Loa already. So that right there tells you that it's kind of an arbo parasite in this case because this is an arthropod and it needs to actually have an infection in its salivary glands in order to deposit the larvae onto the patient. When the fly bites, it creates a little wound and the microfilare or the larvae actually enter into the subcutaneous tissue right there. Once they get into the subcutaneous tissue, they multiply um, and they mate basically. And as they multiply following mating, they then develop into microfilare and eventually adult worms. The microfilare are able to be found in all sorts of tissue, spinal fluid, urine, sputum, peripheral blood, the lungs. Um, and we can find them in the muscle. And one of the places that I associate most is the eyeball. Um, so when an uninfected chrysops then takes a blood meal from this same person, they pick up some of the microfilare, which then go ahead and develop into an infection within that chrysops fly in the salivary gland and the cycle begins all over again. Okay, so what's the take home points? The larvae are the infective form, the diagnostic or disease causing form are your microfilare or your adult worms, and how do you get it? bites of the chrysops fly. All right, so let's talk about the clinical syndromes associated with Loa Loa. Um, first off, it has a pretty long incubation period, anywhere from six months to one year following a bite from an infected chrysops fly, you'll begin to get those symptoms. The first symptoms are actually something called fugitive or calabar swellings. And that's kind of what I'm showing here. Um, you can see this knee is a whole lot more swollen than this knee. Calabar swellings are transient and usually only appear on the extremities, um, and they're produced as the worms migrate through the subcutaneous tissues. And what it is is they create these large nodular areas um, that are often painful and pruritic. Um, so you can get some sort of, um, there's obviously swelling in this area, right? Um, and then the other thing that happens here is that you're getting a lot of edema here. And part of the reason you're getting edema, 
edema is that you actually have a lot of activity by eosinophils. And remember that as eosinophils attack the parasite, they're going to cause degranulation. And degranulation is highly inflammatory. And one way we promote the inflammatory response is by increasing vasodilation. When you increase vasodilation, you have kind of those leaky barriers and a whole lot of fluid can come in here. Um, so basically you have this eosinophilic or almost allergic-like reaction to the worms. Um, the loa loa are also also able to migrate under the conjunctiva and actually kind of, you know, into the eye itself. So again, here's another um, really fabulous picture of a loa loa worm. So this whole clear ridge all the way up and then back down, that's all one worm. So we're talking like centimeters in length um, sometimes. So they produce irritation in the eye, um, painful congestion sometimes in here, uh, painful conjunctiva, obviously edema of the eyelids and normally impaired vision. Um, but it's not always that way. Some cases you have patients where um, it's asymptomatic and the worm is just very long lived. Um, and this is kind of another, this is a microfilare um, that is just kind of burying, burrowing under the skin. So you can see that these worms can kind of get all over in your tissues where they basically form little pockets of um, inflammation and irritation. And the most kind of um, concerning or upsetting of which seems to be the eye. Okay, so let's first talk about diagnosis. Diagnosis is actually fairly easy. Um, you're looking for a patient that has been in an endemic area, that's key. Um, if they've had endemic exposure and you find a worm in their eye, good chance of it being loa loa. Um, it kind of is that simple. You can also look for calabar swellings um, and failing all of that, you can look for the microfilare in the blood where they are readily found typically. How do we treat it? Um, couple options. There's DEC, which is diethylcarbamazine. I'm terrible at pronouncing drug names. You guys all know that about me by now. That drug, so DEC, which is a lot easier to pronounce, is effective for both the microfilare and the adults. Um, corticosteroids. Corticosteroids are actually sometimes kind of important. So remember that I mentioned that those calabar swellings are actually the result of kind of eosinophilic um, response to the parasite. So I want you to think back to immunology and um, you have these Th2 responses. Th2 responses produce a lot of like IL-4 um, and IL-5 and IL-10 and all of these cytokines actually really help with maintenance of eosinophils. These are also the types of cytokines that lead to allergic responses. So what exactly is an allergic response? Well, an allergic response is basically when you have what's supposed to be like an anti-parasitic response, but against something that's not a parasite, like peanuts, right? So the idea is that you get massive release of things like histamine and prostaglandins and leukotrienes that basically lead to smooth muscle contraction and increased um, vascular permeability. So together, you have this kind of overwhelming response. Well, sometimes as we're fighting off the loa loa worm, we have kind of an overwhelming allergic response. So that's why this corticosteroid treatment may be necessary to control the response as the worms die. Um, lastly, there's also albendazole and ivermectin, which have been effective in reducing the microfilarial load as the patient is recovering. That's really all I have on Loa Loa. Thanks for watching.